Hey guys, you're watching Jay's Two Cents, and I'm finally going to get to bring you a video that you've been asking for, and I've been wanting to bring you for a long time. Together, we're going to build a water cooling loop for less than $200, so don't go anywhere. to water cooling loops they can definitely range anywhere from a hundred bucks up to a thousand dollars depending on the parts that you choose and because there's so many parts in between there a lot of people get very confused on how to build their very first water cooling loop so together today I'm going to show you all the basics and I do mean basics on how to build an inexpensive budget custom water cooling loop for your CPU now when it comes to building a custom water loop they can range all over the place in price and people always ask me why you should build a custom water cooling loop hey the Sun's going away People always ask me why you should build a custom water cooling loop compared to going with like an H100i or an H80i or a Kraken or something like that. It really comes down to future customization. The sealed kits are good. They, don't get me wrong, I'm not dogging on the, the sealed kits at all. In fact, we've got an, H80 sitting, an H80i sitting right here in this very expensive, very compact build that we did in a previous video. But the reason why I certainly advocate building your own custom loop is it gives you customization options in the future. If you want to add a graphics card to your loop, you can't do that if you go with an all-in-one unit like behind me. But you can certainly expand upon and upgrade your system over time if you go with a custom loop. So that's what we're focusing on today. When it comes to building your custom loop, there are some parts that are going to be required. And we're talking basic parts. Remember, this video here is all about building a custom loop for your CPU, AMD, or Intel for less than $200. Now when it comes to putting together your system, there are some basic parts you're going to need. And remember, this is a basic build, and by basic I mean we're keeping it under $200, which is a very cheap custom loop. First things first, you're going to need some tubing. And right here we have the Master Clear. It is a red uh, tubing, and it is half inch inner diameter. I prefer, I, I prefer half inch inner diameter, but you could go 3 8 7 16 there's all sorts of sizes. When it comes to size, they're not going to perform any differently. It's just generally as you add more blocks and components to your system, you should go with a larger inner diameter, that way you have better flow. That's the only thing is flow. It has nothing to do with temperatures. Now for the pump in this build, we chose the Phobia DC12 260 pump. Uh, it is a 12 volt pump. It's got a three pin header. Don't put this on your motherboard, by the way, guys. I, I mean, you could, but it's just better to hook it up to a Molex adapter. Um, yeah, it, but it's got plenty of flow. It's got more than enough power to power this entire loop. Uh, push the fluid, no problem. In fact, you could even use this with a graphics card or even multiple blocks and not have any problems whatsoever. It is a non-variable speed pump, but it is very powerful. You're going to need a water block for your CPU, obviously. It's the whole point we're doing this build. And for this build, we are using the Raystorm. Uh, this is a, a acetal and copper block right here. Um, it is by XSPC. It's a great block. I used it in my AMD build, and we're going to be using it in this AMD build that we're going to be using as a test uh, for this entire loop right here. So you're going to need a water block. You're going to need, obviously, a radiator because the radiator is what makes everything cool. We are using the XSPC um, EX240. I believe it's an EX240 is the part number. It's a thin 30 millimeter radiator. Um, it's got plenty of airflow. I mean, you can see right through it. See, so you can see my face. So you can use low speed fans. You're going to need a way to hold all of your fluid. And for that, we chose to go with the Swift Tech. Uh, MC, actually I don't even remember the part number, but it is their Micro Res V2. Um, it's not the flashiest looking reservoir out there, but it's cheap. I mean, you can get these for 25 bucks brand new. And it comes with all the hardware, obviously, to mount it. And it's got multiple port options, and it's very anti-turbulent uh, with this little shelf in here. I highly recommend this reservoir if you're on a budget. You're going to need some fans, obviously, for your radiator. Fans are one of those things where... Noise is certainly the number one issue when it comes to fan. And then on top of that, you've got static pressure and you want to make sure you can get the air through your fans. Now what I have right here are Yate Loon medium speed fans. These are the uh, D12SM12. So this is the uh, medium speed fan right here, which is absolutely 
Water coolers, if you ask any form, any water cooling expert, they'll probably tell you for the best bang for the buck fan, Yate Loons are where you want to go. And you can get these fans for $4 on various water cooling sites and parts uh, sites. I've sleeved these myself, that way they don't look as bad. They do come with bare wires. These are sleeved already. And we're going to be using these fans because of their amazing performance to sound ratio for four bucks. You can't go wrong. Yate Loon fans, definitely consider those. Now you're obviously going to need some fluid for this build. We are just using simple distilled water. Tap water is no good. Purified drinking water is no good. You want distilled water. It, it's a process that gets rid of all of the impurities and all the minerals inside of uh, the fluid. And this is the best thing that you can go with for your system. And when you're doing distilled water, you have to have a way to stop the growth. So you're going to want to go with some sort of an anti-algae uh, additive. This is just PT Nuke. Two drops of it is all you're going to need for the entire loop. Um, you could pre-treat the water. I wouldn't recommend it. Just add it to your system after it's all put together and bleeding. Um, people are going to ask, what about colored fluids or what about like the nano fluid behind you? Fluids are one of those things that have been debated for as long as I've been water cooling, which is easily 10 years. And distilled water is always one of the best performing fluids that you can possibly put in. But because it doesn't have any anti-corrosives in it, if you start mixing metals like copper and nickel and brass and aluminum, depending on the parts you go with, you could start to see corrosion issues. So when you go with a pre-mixed fluid from the various companies that are out there, typically they have some sort of an anti-corrosive additive put into them. Now distilled water over time has never shown to actually corrode the metals, but there are people that would argue that. If you want to take an extra step in precaution, you can get what's called a kill coil. It's basically just a piece of pure silver that you can coil up or inside of, and place it inside of a tube, or you can put it in the bottom of your uh, reservoir. In fact, they, you can see we have these different plugs in here. They even sell um, kill coils that are on a, a, a threaded plug, so you can use it to plug this at the same time the silver is on the inside. I've never ever used a kill coil with any of my distilled water loops and I've never had a problem. You could go with an advanced fluid like I have back here in my system, which is the Mayhem's Nano Fluid. It's not required. It's just one of those things I've actually am testing out for the first time myself. And I'm very impressed with this fluid. But for the basic build like this, distilled water and PT Nuke, some sort of an anti-algae uh, mixture is all you need. Now last but not least, you're going to need some sort of uh, tools, obviously. And for that, I've just got my basic multi-tool, which you've seen in some of my other videos. It's got different uh, Phillips and flathead screwdrivers and nut drivers on it. And then I use uh, actual uh, tubing cutter for my builds because I do water cooling builds all the time. So it's just easier to use that to cut. But you could use a pair of large scissors or a razor blade. Um, when you're cutting thin wall tubing like this, it's not a problem to use scissors. But, but if you do use thicker three quarter inch wall tubing or something, you'll find that razor blades and scissors just can't really get through it as well, which is why I prefer the cutters. Um, these are cobalt, got these at Home Depot for uh, about I think 10 bucks, maybe 15 at the most. So even then it's not that expensive and we may have more uses for you in the future, who knows. A um, Couple of things, uh, accessories that I would say are gonna come in handy. Um, zip ties, for this build we're not using compression fittings, we are gonna be using uh, barbed fittings. You're gonna wanna have two fittings for every single component that you have because every component has an in and an out. So however many components you have, radiator, block, reservoir, pump, that's four. You're going to have two, four, six, eight uh, fittings that are necessary. And because we're keeping things on the cheap, we are going to simply be affixing our tube to the uh, barbs by just using zip ties. It may look a little ghetto, but again, guys, this is the basic water cooling build here. Okay, so now that we've gone over the parts, let's go ahead and turn around and let's get the system prepped and ready to accept the new parts. And so we're going to take off the stock cooler, we're going to take off the upper fan that's in this case behind me. And for those of you that are wondering what we're using here for our video, it is an AMD Athlon X4 with a GTX 460. We're not water cooling the card, only the CPU. And uh, we are putting this in a, H a Cooler Master HAF 922 high airflow case. 
So when it comes to getting your system prepped and ready to go, you're going to want to remove anything from the case that could potentially be in the way or that you wouldn't want to accidentally get damaged. And as always, when you're working with computers, you are going to be, even when you're doing water cooling, you are going to be working with a somewhat static environment. So you want to make sure that you discharge yourself and take the same kind of precautions that you would working and building a computer when handling any of the parts. So to get this computer ready to go, I'm going to remove the graphics card, I'm going to remove any of the cabling out of the way that may be in the, in the way, I'm going to remove the top fan because that's where our radiator is going to go, and I'm going to remove our cooler from our, graphic, from our motherboard, but we're going to leave the socket in place. We're then going to cool off, cool off, yeah we're going to definitely cool off this baby. We are going to clean off the uh, processor here with 75% uh, or greater isopropyl alcohol. We are using 91% here with a lint-free uh, paper towel and uh, clean it off with a microfiber at the end so you have a nice perfectly clean finish uh, on the top of the processor. So we'll go ahead and do that and then we'll come back afterwards and show you what comes next. Okay, now on this build, because we are going AMD, we're going to have to go ahead and also remove the stock uh, socket retainer here for the AMD. You're going to have to consult your block and your motherboard, depending on the chipset and what you're going with, specifically for your parts to see whether or not you do or don't have to do this. So definitely consult the manual that comes with your CPU block and follow those instructions, not necessarily mine. Okay, so now that we've got the system ready to go, I've removed the top fan for the uh, radiator. We have room for that. And I've removed the AMD socket and the stock cooler from that. And this is why I want to point out that it's very important to use quality thermal compound. Most of the time, the thermal compound that comes with your CPU blocks for your water cooling kit are going to be perfectly fine. But as an option, you may want to choose to use a thermal compound that you like. For this build, I'm going to be using Tunic TX4. The socket thermal paste or the CPU thermal paste that came on the stock cooler over time turned into this and as you can see that is a very very nasty uh, it, this is what this is why CPUs cook themselves and overheat over time the thermal compound breaks down and no longer does its job in fact that's one of the reasons why we're water cooling this PC now because this thing has been getting extremely hot and uh, for the sake of this video, we're now putting water cooling in here so that you guys can learn how to do it. So now that we've got all that ready to go, the next thing you want to do is you want to install your CPU block onto your CPU, use your thermal compound, use the method that's comfortable to you, and then we will uh, come back and show you what's next. Okay, now we've got the CPU block installed per the manufacturer installation recommendations. Definitely consult your manual, make sure you're installing that right. You don't want to take any chances with your CPU socket. Now most water blocks will have marked on them an inlet and an outlet. It's very important that you keep that in mind when you're positioning your block because you want to make sure that it's on the optimal side of however you're going to run this loop. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and prep our radiator. We're going to get our fans mounted to that. We're going to get the radiator mounted up on the top. Now the most common question people ask when it comes to radiator installation and when it comes to the fans is whether or not they should go in a pull configuration, which is where the fan pulls the air through the radiator and exhausts it, or if they should go in a push configuration where the fan goes under the radiator and pushes air through it. There's really not been any seriously conclusive evidence that either one is better than the other. The most optimal would obviously be a push-pull, which is where you have a fan on either side of the radiator, kind of like this, pushing air and pulling air at the same time on the different fan st uh, spots on the fan for the radiator. But in a basic build like this, we're not going to do that. Um, I personally, in low, fin, in low fin count radiators like this one here, which is optimized for slower speed fans, I prefer a uh, push configuration. That way the fan has as much air available to it and the air only has one way to go which is through the radiator. So because you're dealing with a lower speed fan, I prefer a push configuration. So we're going to be setting up these fans here to push the air through the radiator like this and that the radiator is then going to get mounted to the top of the case like so. So we're going to have the fans on the bottom pushing air through the top. Now you also want to keep in mind which is going to be most convenient on which end to have the barbs on. You can install the radiator like this with the barbs in the back, or you can install the radiator the other way with the barbs in the front, depending on what's most convenient. So you're going to have to kind of plan ahead a little bit on the routing for your tubing and determine which is going to be best for you. Now 
just a little tech tip when it comes to installing the fans onto your radiator, you want to make sure that you use the included hardware with your radiator. If you bought the radiator new, it's going to come with the specific screws intended for your radiator. If you take screws that are too long, say these guys right here, they can potentially push all the way through the fan and all the way down into the radiator tubes. Some of the rows in the radiators, which is the passages that the fluid fl uh, flows through, it's hard to say, that the fluid flows through may line up perfectly with those screws. And if you puncture that, your radiator is toast. So you want to make sure that you use the right screw, that, you don't, that it comes with the radiator. And if you have to buy hardware at Home Depot, you definitely want to make sure that you measure and get the right screws. That way you don't puncture your radiator. So a little tech tip for you, be very careful that you don't screw the radiator, uh, the fan too far down into the radiator and that your screws are the proper length. Very important. Okay, so now that we've got the radiator together, we've got the fans mounted, uh, you want to kind of keep the cabling nice and orderly. We mounted the fans on the side that the cables come out the back. That way they're easily tucked away and they're not going to be in the way making your build look tacky. So now that we've got things ready to go, let's go ahead and mount it to the top of the case. And then from there, we'll start planning where we're going to put our tubing and our pump. And we'll get this thing up and running in no time. Okay, we're back. We've got the radiator mounted on the top. We've got the CPU block installed on the CPU here. The next thing we want to do is get the rest of our parts ready to go. And you want to install your fittings on top of uh, your other parts or in your other parts. That's going to include reservoir, pump, and uh, that's pretty much it, what's left on these. Now, a point I want to make when it comes to installing the fittings on your various parts. Most of the parts you'll be dealing with, uh, the top of this block, this pump, this reservoir, they're all plastic. So it's really important that you don't over tighten. When it comes to installing a metal barb onto a plastic piece, it's really easy to strip out the threads. And once you do that, you just ruined your day. What you want to do is you want to tighten these down hand tight until you can't get them any tighter. And then if what I typically do is I take a wrench and I'll turn it just maybe an eighth turn more. Now if you're dealing with a metal part, you can tighten it down a little bit more. It's going to be one of those topics that's a little bit debated on how tight you should do it. Some people say hand tight only and nothing more. Uh, I agree with that statement only for good measure. I do about another eighth of a turn more with the wrench and I've never once stripped any sort of thread. I've never had any problems. So let's go ahead and get the rest of our parts ready to go. And what we're going to do now is we're going to start getting our parts positioned on where we think we'll have the most optimal flow and pattern here inside of our system. It's going to be a little bit unique in this case. This case is not as water cooling friendly as many others on the market. If you're dealing with a small case, it's going to be really tight. And because of the limited mounting options of this pump, I'm probably going to end up going two-sided tape. Uh, which may sound really ghetto, but I've done it myself for years and had no problems whatsoever. But when it comes to the order of parts, since we're now going to be planning our system, is you need to make sure that you have the outlet of your reservoir directly feeding the inlet of the pump, and that the reservoir, at least level-wise, is higher than the pump. That way gravity can feed into the pump when you're priming your system. We'll talk more about that when it comes time to fill your system and bleed it, but make sure that you have your pump being fed directly by the reservoir and that the reservoir is a little bit higher than the pump. That's very, very important. Okay, I'm back now and it's starting to get dark because it took me so long to figure out how I wanted to run this. So I've gone ahead and mounted my reservoir and my pump because those are the two, as I mentioned in the previous segment, that have the most important correlation with each other. So what I've come up with here is I've got the pump or the reservoir mounted to the drive cage and I've got the pump mounted to the floor directly below the reservoir. So you can see we've got a short little piece of tubing feeding it and we barely made this fit because we have the PCI Express cables here for our GTX 460 and we've got to make a fairly decent loop out of the pump into the radiator. In fact we're going to go into the radiator over here. So it's going to be a long piece of tube which isn't quite ideal but unfortunately the half 922 is not as friendly as I would like it to be. Plus because we're on the cheap we're not using any 45 or 90 degree elbow fittings because that makes the easily double the cost of this build. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to kind of plan out where I'm going to route my tubing. I'm going to get my tubing cut, measure twice, cut once because once you cut it you can't make it longer again. Then I'm going to wire, uh, hose up. We're going we're gonna to get some hose up in here. Keep your mind clean there guys. And you're going to pull out your hose, again, keep your mind clean, and we're going to get this thing uh, plumbed up 
and then I'll show you how we came up with the path that we have and hopefully it won't look ridiculous but it's definitely going to get the job done. Okay, now one quick tip I want to show you here. When you're using a thin wall tubing like this, it's really easy to get a kink. If, it's, if you can't really see that too well, this tube right here is pinched completely shut because of how tight of a bend that is. But it's not only because it's a tight bend, it's also because the tubing is too long. So if you get a kink like that, you can slowly start trimming off the end of the tube, and then you'll notice that that kink will start becoming a little bit less and less each time. And you can also kind of do a little bit of a, just a little bit of eyeballing on there. And then eventually you'll get it so that once it's in there, it's not kinking at all. In fact, we're almost there now. We still got a little bit of a kink, but we'll get, uh, we'll get that squared away. Okay, so here's our order. We've got reservoir to pump, and one thing that's very important is that you actually have the reservoir feeding the inlet of the pump. Every pump has an inlet and an outlet, and it does matter. So make sure you consult your pump's manual to find out which inlet and outlet, uh, which ports are inlet and outlet. So we're going from reservoir to pump, from pump into the radiator, out of the radiator into the CPU block, and out of the CPU block back into the reservoir. Now it's not the cleanest loop but it gets the job done and this is a when you go with a budget system like this it's definitely going to be about function over form so it it really doesn't look so bad in person i mean you can kind of see on the camera there it's it's a little bit uh blood looking and intestiny but it gets the job done so the next thing we're going to do now is we're going to simply zip tie off each one of these barbs uh, right on the point where it uh, meets the tube and then we are going to come back, we're going to start filling it up and performing our leak test. Okay, so everything's now plumbed up and all of the connections have been zip tie fitted, nothing's going to go anywhere. So now when it comes to filling your loop, you're going to fill in uh, using your reservoir, obviously, hopefully your reservoir has an inlet on the top, and you're going to fill this lower, uh, or you're going to fill this reservoir as far up as it will go, and then you're going to slightly lean the case around to get some of that fluid to move around into the pump and into, into here. And then you're going to cycle the pump on and on for only a few seconds at a time just so that it pulls the fluid in. Once the fluid goes down into the pump, you want to turn it off before it runs dry and rinse and repeat that process. Now it's very important that you don't run your pump dry. Running it dry is definitely the worst thing you can do for it. The fluid actually works as a, as a lubricant for the bearing. It's a floating bearing in there, which means the lubricant moves around the bearing and it causes it to never touch the side of the housing or the motor housing. So if you run it dry, it's just grinding against the housing and it will destroy a pump in no time flat. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and get the system bled. We're going to fill the reservoir as far as we can, cycle the pump on and off. And by cycling the pump, you're going to want to use either a second power supply or you can unhook the 24 pin power supply uh, in your plug here. And then you can jumper the green and black uh, wire on your 24 pin. Make sure it is not plugged into your motherboard. And then you can uh, jumper these two pins, cycle your power supply on and off. That way you can run your pump without killing your system in the meantime. Now as you start to fill your system, you're going to want to make sure that you don't fill it too fast. Because you are dealing with a uh, closed loop, it's pretty much sealed once you start to fill it with water here. It may not flow down into the reservoir as fast as you're pouring it, so you don't want to have it leak inside of your system. Also, once you start to fill up uh, down here and the water level starts to rise, we have water uh, right here in the tube. You want to just kind of preliminarily check, preliminarily, preliminarily, I don't even know if that's a word. You want to make sure that none of these fittings are leaking right here, first off. So that's kind of your first uh, process of doing a leak check. It's as you're pouring, you're going to be keeping an eye out for anything that may be leaking. Okay, so now that we've got the reservoir as full as it will go, in fact, we've actually backed up slightly into the funnel. It's a good thing my funnel makes a seal as I push it down in there. This is the part where we're going to jump our power supply and we're going to start cycling the pump until it pulls that fluid down, starts making flow, and then we're going to turn it off, refill it, and rinse and repeat. See, as fast as I turned on that pump, it pulled almost all of that fluid down in there. That's kind of the drawback of having a small reservoir like this, but unfortunately it's just the part we're using, so we need to make sure that we don't run it dry. So you have to be fast on the switch.
Okay, we're going to start getting to the point now to where it's going to start making a complete loop. Because up until now, every time it's pulled in the fluid, it's never come back out into the reservoir, which means we still have more air than fluid in the system. But now we're getting to the point to where it's going to start making a complete flow, which is where we're going to want to start doing our leak testing and then making sure that we keep the reservoir topped off as the air works its way out of the system. Yeah, as you can see now, like I said, we've reached that part where we're getting a complete flow going. The water is very aerated for two reasons. One, the water level is low, and two, there's a lot of air in the system, and air is going to take time to work its way out. It's going to get trapped up here in the radiator, it's going to get trapped uh, some of these tubes. So now is where we want to top it off to where the water level is at least higher than the return line, and then we're going to just let it run for a while, turning it on and off and on and off, making sure that we can get the air to move out of the places that it's trapped. But as you can see, the pump is quieting down. We've got a lot less aeration going on there. But all of these little bubbles that you see churning around here in the corner, those are uh, a sign that we still have air in the system. So we're going to let this go for a while. We're going to turn it off. We're going to turn it back on. And every time we do, you're going to notice that we get more air bubbles. Now one other thing that you can do to help promote movement of air inside the system is just to kind of slowly tilt it along on its edges like this. And every time you do, you'll usually see more bubbles working their way out of the system. Now don't tilt too far, especially if you have your reservoir open, because if you do, you're going to find that you're going to leak water all over the place. And now that we've got the system filled and it's running and we're letting it bleed, this is where we're going to start doing our leak test. And to do that, we're going to put paper towels around all of our components that have a fitting. That way we can check to see if we're getting any sort of leakage from uh, any of these fittings. Now one last trick that you can do to help promote the movement of air inside of your system is if you have thin wall tubing like this is you can pinch it a few times and every time you do you'll notice this is semi-transparent tubing so I can see the fluid moving through here and I can also see where we have some of the air trapped. Now when it comes to leak testing, a lot of the experts will tell you that they recommend leak testing anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. I definitely recommend that if you're new to water cooling and you have never dealt with it before. I would leave all of your components unplugged, leave your paper towels, and leave the uh, PSU or the power supply unit jumpered like this with the pump running uh, for at least 24 hours prior to putting all of your components back to power because I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do probably 20 minutes at best because I've done so many systems and I'm so confident in my ability to water cool and the fact that we already have no leaks. Leaks tend to not really form over time unless you have a degradation of parts or an o-ring fail or something like that which is no amount of leak testing would find if something's going to fail anyway. So. I definitely recommend if you're new, perform a good, long leak test. If you're an experienced builder, chances are that you're just watching this video for fun and uh, we'll want to let this thing run for a while and make sure that we have no leaks. Now over time, the water fluid is going to start to drop because we are still replacing air with fluid. So you'll want to just keep an eye on the water level and you'll want to refill that as necessary. But before you close your reservoir back up, you want to leave at least a little bit of space for air to move to. That way the air has a place to go and replace itself with fluid. So leave a little bit of air gap at the top. Don't fill all the way to the brim. Okay, so now that you've performed all of your leak testing, your system is running, there's no leaks, you're happy with it. The last thing you want to do is you want to add two drops of your anti-fungal, anti-algae, um, your PT nuke, whatever you want to call it, um, to your water cooling loop. And we're talking just two drops is all that's needed. This is very strong stuff. And you can add this right into your reservoir and then this will, add, this will protect your system from there being any sort of algae growth uh, at all over time. Okay, and just one last point I'd like to make now before we finish up is the tubing right here that runs in front of the graphics card. I made sure that it was a little bit longer than necessary because we want to make sure that if you have to access your graphics card and get it out of there, that you can do so without the tubing blocking it in. So we have plenty of slack on here that way we can get the graphics card out if we need to do that. Okay, so that's it. Now, if you followed this tutorial, you would have built your very first water cooling system for your CPU. This is everything done behind me. As you can see, we added a red light. It really doesn't look too bad, and the tubing doesn't really look out of place. 
On this AMD Athlon X4, at stock speeds right now, our core under load, and this is load, 25 degrees Celsius. <laughs> we are running Prime 95 right now, and 25 degrees Celsius, and the 22 degrees on the CPU socket, 25 on the core. Now this is at stock speeds, but what does this mean? If when you run this type of cooling option, you get a lot more headroom to do cool things with your computer. Overclocking and stress testing and better performance in gaming. So now we're going to overclock this thing. We're going to end this video. Hopefully you guys found this easy. We're going to overclock this, see exactly what we can get out of it, see how much temperature headroom we have. This thing is running so cool, it's actually surpassing what I thought it would perform as. Very simple loop, didn't cost a lot. I hope you found this video very helpful. Now if you're not a beginner and you already know the basics of water cooling but you were hoping to learn a little bit more about doing uh, advanced water cooling techniques and multiple radiators, stronger pumps, bigger reservoirs and how to plumb everything to look very very cool and streamlined and flashy and all that cool stuff and you have a lot more budget to spend to do that then you're definitely going to want to stay tuned for next week when I show you how to build an advanced water cooling system with multiple radiators and high-end luxury parts for water cooling. Thanks for watching guys, as always, if you've liked this video, you know what to do. If you stumbled across my channel and liked what you saw, I hope you stick around and hit that subscribe button because it'll get you more videos like this from myself, Jay's Two Cents. And as always, I'll see you guys in my next video.